Society for Healthcare Innovations interview series. Today with us, we have Trevor Price, the CEO and founder of Oxian Holdings. Thank you for joining us today, Trevor. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about Oxion and a bit about how you guys are addressing the pandemic. Uh, sure. I mean, I'll start with uh, Oxion. I guess the way that uh, I have come to describe Oxion Holdings, and Oxion Holdings is a traditional, typical holding structure that kind of uh, combines three different fundamental businesses. And the way that I would uh, present it to your society is as a three-circle Venn diagram. Uh, the first circle in our Venn diagram is a, is a leading retained executive search firm. And it's really interesting to, before passing judgment immediately uh, by saying, did he just say a recruiting firm? It's really important to hear uh, a why and how we do what we do, which is when we started the recruiting firm, it was under a fundamental belief that people are more important than products and markets in building healthcare companies, in particular in building healthcare companies, and that great teams build great companies and mediocre to poor teams can blow up great companies. And given the fact that almost everything in healthcare is associated with a huge uh, TAM, it's not, you're not seeking a large TAM, you're, and technology is kind of pretty outdated in healthcare. And so did you have the, you have the right team to execute? And so we created an executive search firm whose mission was to make people healthier. And that's a, there's probably not a recruiting firm in the country or in the world that has that as their mission. And our, our executive search firm has, core, has five core values, intellectual curiosity, spirit of generosity, collaboration, grit, and EQ. And so at least the first three are non-existent core values in recruiting. And you can't have that mission and those core values and then pay people commissions or whatever synonym of commissions, uh, like most recruiting firms. So our firm doesn't pay a dollar of commission or any synonym of commission. So we are probably the only recruiting firm with that mission, we're the only recruiting firm with those values and the only recruiting firm um, that doesn't pay commissions. And so, and the reason why is because we always felt like um, we would have a disproportionate effect on the success of an entrepreneurial company in healthcare by building a great leadership team. And if that statement was right, then we want to invest in them. Um, and so we, from day one, uh, uh, either invested any, we invested 100% of the search firm's profits uh, in back into our clients. We converted fees to equity. And in just a classic Oxian way, everyone in our firm owns equity in all of those investment stakes, regardless of whether or not you worked on the company. So we, have, we took like a fundamentally entrepreneurial approach to executive search. And one of the reasons why, the secondary and tertiary reason why is, I mean, I just explained the first reason, which is our mission. But in reality, we have about 25,000 conversations a year with C-suite healthcare executives. Uh, we do about 150 retained executive searches. There's roughly 200 to 250 conversations per search. Run the math. We are talking to the entire ecosystem of the most senior, the most high impact executives in healthcare. And in each one of those conversations, we can ask questions like, what problems are you trying to solve? What opportunities do you see? What products do you need? What markets are interesting? What, how are you facing disruption, et cetera, et cetera. And, if you meta tag all of the answers to those questions and you ask those questions some substantial percentage of the time in your 25,000 conversations, you see these massive heat maps of problems and opportunities. And that out of our exec, as a byproduct of our executive search firm, those heat maps and those problem opportunity sets drive the other two portions of the Venn diagram. Second one is our investment fund. Uh, called Town Hall Ventures. We formed that two years ago when we joined forces with Andy Slavitt, who ran uh, was the CMS administrator for Obama uh, and actually did the turnaround of the healthcare.gov uh, tech platform. And Andy saw all the companies that we had invested in and, and approached us and said, would you ever want to join forces? Um, and we did that. And so today, Town Hall manages $375 million of assets under management. And we invest in disruptive businesses that um, serve vulnerable populations. So the frail, the elderly, the underserved, uh, and some of this we'll get into when we talk about COVID. If you think about the overlaps between the search firm and the investment fund, the search firm's an incredible deal sourcing uh, engine, is amazingly valuable in terms of doing diligence on a company. Um, obviously, once we invest in the company, 
the executive search firm is the absolute engine for business development and revenue growth and partnerships and, and building the teams, et cetera. Um, the Town Hall Ventures Limited Partners are really interesting. They're large health systems, they're large health plans. They're a roster of close to 50 of the kind of leading healthcare executives and investors that have put their money into the fund. And so that's a very symbiotic relationship. The third circle of the Venn diagram is something we call a venture studio. So we basically take about 20% of our pre-tax profit out of the search firm and we run a venture studio. So if you, you know, if you guys at Wharton were coming in and, 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 and looking to buy our search firm, you'd say this thing's really poorly run because all of our margins are 20% less than any other recruiting firm, except we're taking 2 million of pre-tax profit, which we would be taxed effectively 50%. And instead, we're running a venture studio where we create, on average, two companies a year that we own 100% of the equity in, right? So we're diverting a, a taxable income into a capital gain, and we own 100% of the equity because we're creating the company. Similarly, now, now think about that three-circle Venn diagram. The search firm is, a, is an engine for ideas and validation and go-to-market and product insight, and all of the executives that the search firm knows feeds the venture studio. The venture studio creates these business plans, uh, at which point when we get the company, the business plan to a point where it's validated, the search firm can build out its leadership team, can connect it to its clients, the investment fund gets to invest in it. We obviously need conflict of interest and all that. But when you put the three circles of the Venn diagram together, the middle of that three circle Venn diagram are ideas that have been sourced, vetted, validated, amongst the executive search firm, the venture studio, or the fund, and all three participate. And that's really um, what Oxian Holdings is all about. That's amazing. Thank you for spelling that out. Super fun. Um, so obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic and you guys have your ear to the ground in a lot of these different areas. What are you seeing in terms of innovation and innovative responses uh, to this pandemic? And how have you guys as a firm reacted yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, uh, the executive search firm, I, I would be disingenuous if I said I wasn't concerned. I think I'm concerned about our baby. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of executive recruiting going on right now. And so, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to support all of our portfolio companies. And, uh, you know, we continue to have core values of intellectual curiosity and a spirit of generosity. And, I think long, medium to long term, I'm very optimistic about Oxian as a firm, just because uh, you know I think healthcare will be an area that you know obviously is in the spotlight right now and is going to have to change and transform a lot. And our work with businesses like Landmark and Aspire and Oak Street Health and Iora and Evelyn and a lot of the what I'll call Generation One disruptors around value based care um, should should help. And we've been very active in supporting those companies. A lot of those companies are actually part of the solution in handling some of the issues. Um, when you turn around from the, from the, from the fund side, what, what's happened is because of Andy's involvement at a national level and because of you know, his set of relationships, we got a pretty early look at what is happening, uh, what was gonna be happening because of COVID. Um, we probably got a sense that this was gonna be a real problem several weeks before a lot of people did. And so, we spent a bunch of time fortifying our portfolio companies. And again, a lot of our portfolio companies are growing into COVID actually, are structuring new contracts. Ready Responders is a great example of a business that is absolutely right in the middle of a COVID solution. And Eleanor Health that provides you know, tele-solutions for opioid use and substance use disorders. A critical landmark health delivers care in the home. City Block deals with complex Medicaid populations. These are all businesses that... Um, while right now there's a lot of uncertainty, they will fortify. What we've done beyond that is Andy's obviously activated at a national level and has become a real voice um, around the COVID crisis. He, on a, in, a, in a bipartisan way, is actively engaged with the White House and is actively engaged with Democratic and Republican governors and senators around the country. He's, he's uh, providing briefings and, and, and working on, on a number of different levels. He, he and a number of people created the hashtag stay home movement. He was involved in the contract tracing announcement with Google and Apple and others. He's been very involved. I 
on the other hand, have really focused my efforts on doing what um, entrepreneurs and doing what recruiters do in the face of a healthcare crisis, which is, you know, I recruited, uh, you know, now close to 60 to 70 organizations in New York City to try to create a uh, rapid response coalition to serve vulnerable populations. The, the idea was when Andy and David and I looked at the data, you know, probably six weeks ago, it was very, very clear that ICU, ER uh, bed uh, capacity was going to be a humongous issue. And in particular, for two different populations in New York and, and elsewhere in the country, the first uh, was those people who had yet to contract COVID, but if they did, would be a rapid high probability progression to the ER ICU. So obviously, we know now the elderly, uh, the frail, those with uh, existing health conditions, if they contracted COVID, would end up at the hospital at a, at a, at a much higher rate. Second population, which I don't think has got nearly as much coverage yet, is those people with existing health conditions. You know, CKD, ESRD, COPD, uh, CHF, congestive heart failure, hypertension, all of these chronic complex conditions that are treated by a healthcare system that has home care workers and transportation and federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, and, and other community-based organizations. Um, that, that system has broken down in New York. Those people are not coming to work. Uh, the doors are closed on a lot. I mean, just, it's horrifying, but the doors are closed or closing on many of the community-based organizations in New York. And so we several, you know, four weeks ago when we launched this said, can we get to those two types of, those two populations, the ones who have not contracted it, but when they do, we'll go to the emergency room, the ones who will never contract it and we'll get there. And so we built basically the demand side of the engine by engaging all the safety net hospitals and health plans. We got Amazon Web Services to contribute a bunch of technology to do scaled digital engagement. So we have today, you know, between 10 and 20,000 SMS uh, text messages going out to very high risk New Yorkers engaging on whether they need food or medication or housing support, or they need to talk to a doctor or a specialist. And then we built these dynamic networks of providers. So we have organizations that are delivering food and delivering medication and delivering telemental health and delivering telecardiology or whatever it is, um, all pro bono, uh, have not spent a dollar building it, which is just going to, will be a source of pride for all of us. We have stand up calls amongst this coalition. Um, and, and then last point is we built it as a playbook. So we said, look, New York's going through this before almost anyone other than Seattle and the United States, let's build a playbook. And so we have created a playbook which can be used in other cities around the country that are ahead of facing a surge. That playbook is free. Uh, you can get it on our website, which is www.nyccovid19.org, or you could go to the United States of Care, which is a nonprofit that Andy started and that I'm involved in, and we've posted the, the playbook there. So it's been, I love working in healthcare every day. I would never do anything different, but I have, frankly, I've really particularly loved working in healthcare over the last four to five to six weeks as the COVID crisis has emerged because um, the system needs all of us and the system needs people to think differently. And these populations, these vulnerable populations that have been left behind and are disproportionately affected today, by the way, when the crisis goes away for all of us who you know, live, live pretty good lives, they're all, they, the crisis will remain for all of them. Uh, they will and, still and be worse and, and, and worsen in a lot of ways. And, and Absolutely think, worsen. Uh, you know, I think Medicaid, the Medicaid population enrollment is going to explode. Many of the community-based uh, health care providers are going to go out of business. Uh, they, you know, look at, look at Stimulus 3. They gave, I think, $1.2 billion for community health, community health care organizations, FQHCs. They're distributing the capital on a per capita basis. So FQHCs in parts of the country that have yet to see anyone with COVID are getting as much money as someone in the depths of Brooklyn that is that literally is going to die is going to shut down and, and cease to exist because of this. So uh, yeah, it's it's going to get more complex versus less. Yeah, and, and I think you hit on one of the important topics, right? A, a lot of smart folks in healthcare are talking about the second wave, right? And the second wave may not be a reemergence of COVID so much as it is 
that vulnerable uh, population suffering from chronic disease. And I work in the chronic care management space, so I'm familiar with this, right? These are folks who have, may not have money for medication, may not have money for co-pays, right? And they are hit disproportionately hard. So I think what you guys have built is amazing. Yeah, I think it's, and, and you know, like, look, it's not even buying medication, it's food. Like the amount of food that is needed for people. I mean, there is a serious food issue. I, I think one of the opportunities that will, I know uh, J1 Rue at, at, at Geisinger and, 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 and um, uh, you know, Geisinger's done a really good job of building what they call a fresh, fresh pharmacy. pharmacy. Yeah, yeah. Amazing program. yeah. And the idea of, of, of food as a form of medication I think we'll gain a lot of traction out of this because right now, at least in New York, you know, the Medicaid plans don't pay for food and they don't pay for food to be delivered. So there's tons and tons of like food available in New York City, but it's impossible to get it to the people who need it. And you don't want them leaving their homes, going to a food bank or going to a church or going to a school because they're going to increase the likelihood of contracting COVID. Right. Um, and Look at, uh, you know, North Carolina Medicaid put together a program where kids had asthma and they replaced the rugs. So I think if you can, you know, there are places where that innovation is, is kind of coming ahead of the curing the problem when the patient needs to go to the hospital. I guess to your point, unfortunately, that, that's not yet a reality in New York. Do you see that shifting as a direct result of this pandemic? I do see it shift. I mean, look, Andy and I have been having some pretty, pretty good debates on it. I think he, from a federal funding standpoint, remains skeptical that that it will it will stick. I would say, um, and we c continue to come back to the same thing, which is the ROI on what we're describing as determinants of health or social determinants of health is a is a logical, intuitive, heart stomach based ROI that at least today does not have enough data in spreadsheets to convince the powers that be that, that it's an economic, there's an economic justification to, to, to spending the money on determinants of health. Um, but I think the data that comes out of uh, this, this COVID crisis with, and you know, this current one, and then if it rebounds uh, in the, uh, you know, if it doesn't fully weigh in at rebound, part, one of the silver lines out of this may be real data on, um, you know, extreme amounts of data in a short period of time that said, if you intervene with food and housing and look, mental health is not a social determinant of health, but you know, let's, let's look at the, let's look at the impact of investing in mental health right now as well. We might see massive amounts of data aggregated over a short period of time uh, around the impact of these entities with taking, taking care of vulnerable uh, Americans. One of, the, one of our missions and kind of this, this podcast, specifically focused on COVID-19 is providing that playbook. Uh, New York and Seattle were hit first, but, but we know that it's coming to other places. And so if someone was looking to set up something similar to what you did with um, nyccovid19.org, yeah. what do you know now, having begun to set this up that you didn't know when you started that would have been helpful for you? Uh, yeah, one of the first things I think um, I have seen is you know, there are a ton of very well-meaning uh, nonprofit social services organizations, uh, not-for-profit health systems uh, operating, for example, in New York City. The level of coordination and communication and integration is, um, is, not, is not as great as it could be. So I do think businesses like Unite Us and Now Pow and others are, are going to play a huge role in this. And we're an investor, full disclosure, we're an investor in, in Unite Us. But I think these organizations that are connecting and building the network, I also would have said, I will say this, like when we started the uh, Rapid Response Coalition, we were very, very clear. This was a humanitarian effort. We need to put aside our competitive issues. We need to put aside our self-interest. This is all about activating and motivating a, 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 a solution for these people in New York that need it. Um, and what's really interesting is this is only a N of one, but the, um, the venture private equity backed for-profit companies in New York were far more willing to follow that edict. Meaning they were willing to put aside their, their differences. And I, I, you know, 
we have Caramore and we have City Block and we have Landmark and all these guys are in a way competitive, but they were able to kind of point out the not for profits just because they're not for profit does not mean they're not, you know, like very competitive. Right. And I would tell you that, you know, if you, if there are people out there listening to this and you want to start the rapid response, start a rapid response type coalition that, you know, get the playbook, let me know, happy to talk. But the thing that we did that was in some ways the most effective was we started convening a stand-up call with all the coalition members. And so we have 60, 70 healthcare organizations uh, dialing in at 7.30 in the morning and people submit ideas ahead of time. We group think and crowdsource different solutions. The sense of community and the, the, that call has catalyzed this sense of like, we're all here helping each other and we're all trying to um, provide each other solutions. And there's some dark, dark things that we've had to deal with, right? There's a issue in New York right now where there's no uh, refrigerated transportation and no morgue space. So there's dead bodies to the tune of a hundred to 200 a day that are collecting in apartments in New York that can't be moved. And so this coalition is trying to figure that out or one of the big hospital systems, everyone's talking about ventilators, but what they really need is they need respiratory therapists and they need pressured gas engineers and plumbers because uh, I'm not going to name the name, but one of the hospital systems in New York has to go from between 2,500 and 3,000 hospital beds with 300 ICU beds to 4,500 hospital beds. And all of them have to be ventilated. All of them need pressurized gas to them. So, Everyone in the system is helping out. Like one hospital needs respiratory, th respiratory therapists. Another group says, this is where we got ours. You should use them. Right. And so that sense of, I, I I've used the Winston Churchill never waste a great crisis uh, quote many times over the last month, but that sense of common, you know, we're in this together um, has been an absolutely uh, high impact uh, element of, of what we've done in New York. And it's relatively easy. You know, it does help to have a recruiter, right? This is a classic recruiting skill set. Um, but it does, it, it, if you have a convener or you have a, a couple of connectors and people are doing this in Chicago and, and DC and you know, the people who've come to do it in Chicago are, are that type of, those type of people, they're connectors or conveners, they catalyze things. And um, that has been really, really powerful here in New York. Amazing. Well, Trevor, this uh, sounds like an amazing effort. So thank you for what you've put together. Yeah. Uh, I know we're, we're wrapping up on time. So if you have a final uh, message you'd like to leave folks with, perhaps we could tie in that background. Um, but anything you have to share with folks? The dude abides. Um, you know, uh, what I've been saying to everyone who's not in New York is... Um, this is a little bit like when you get on a flight and they teach, you know, they prepare you for using the oxygen masks and they say, you know, um, secure your own oxygen mask before taking care of the person next to you. I, I, I do think there's an element of this. I do recommend that it's important for everyone to get their families in a, in a safe place and to be safe themselves. And then I will tell you that the, the people, we now know this, uh, we didn't know this in New York, the people who are, way more affected by this are those of those people of color, those people of ethnic uh, diversity, those people of so different, you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and, you know, the sad thing is those are the people who are generally kind of left behind and forgotten by our healthcare system. And so, you know, now is a time to rally. And then I think we all have to think about what this crisis can teach us about um, providing a better public health care system for a lot of these people once COVID has, 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 has waned. So those, that would be my, those would be my quick thoughts and, you know, mainly stay safe. Amazing. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, for those watching, Trevor has his own podcast called a healthy dose, which is amazing. I'm an avid listener. So check that out if you'd like. Uh, again, this is the society for healthcare innovation. And thank you again for joining us today, Trevor. Thank you. Thanks a lot.